All right. Well, I have a chance to speak a few times, and I thought this is wonderful. I love the law of the Lord. And um, I'm going to spend the times I have this spring to try to perhaps uh, help all of us think again about how excited Christians should be about the law of the Lord. Uh, sometimes in Christian history, Christians have been taught there's sort of this alienation between the Christian life and being a follower of Christ and the law. The law is painted in very pejorative terms. And uh, part of that is because, of course, there's some verses that people can go to that sometimes say things like that, and we'll look at those before the spring's over, hopefully. And then sometimes people say verses say things that they don't say. That's the tricky thing. When I was first a Christian, this was you know, over 50 years ago, <laughs> You know, I heard the Pat verses on, you know, the laws nailed to the cross and these kind of things. And so I got a pretty strong, you know, indoctrination of, you know, Christians aren't interested in the law. We don't do, you know, Sabbath and et cetera. And then, you know, life moves on and you get a little more facility with scripture. And so that text in Colossians 2, that's where that is about the law was nailed to the cross. I started looking at that and I discovered the word law is not even in the verse. And to make matters worse, the word law is not even in the book. Of Colossians. So I, I thought, okay, we have to start looking at this fresh, and maybe I've been taught some things that weren't quite the way I was taught. So today we're going to look quickly at some stuff in the Gospel of Matthew. And uh, you'll know these verses. If you don't have scripture with you, you'll know them. The point I want to talk about is maybe just to clarify some things about how God views his words for us, his law for us. Uh, one of the misconceptions that I in the past had, and I think maybe sometimes people still do, is that sort of all laws are created equal. You know, we have these hundreds of laws, and Christians have many laws, and that they're sort of all of equal weight, equal significance, and that's a really flawed understanding. Um, they're all from God, of course, uh, but they're not all of equal significance. And so, um, for example, if you turn to the Sermon on the Mount, uh, there's uh, before you get into the uh, antitheses, you've heard that it was said to men of old, but I say to you that big long section. Is from, right before you get to that section, there's a little sort of disclaimer where Jesus wants them to understand that he's not saying bad things about the law. And so, in that, okay, just that little disclaimer that precedes that, there's a thing where Jesus talks about the fulfillment of the law and the importance of that, importance of that. and he says in verse 19. Anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments. And so right there, Jesus is saying, okay, there are commandments that are least, you know. And his point is to say, and you should have honor and reverence for all of God's commandments. But in expressing it the way he did, he does tell us that there's some that are least. And so if you read Matthew forward, which is always a great way to do it, you know, um, then you're prepared later when we get to a conversation that's over in chapter 22, where people come up to him and say, teacher, you know, what's the most important law? And so this will be in Matthew 22. It's a, it's a well-known section. It's toward the end of Jesus' life when there's this give and take on several topics with antagonists. Um, and so in verse 34 of Matthew 22, Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together, you know, they're sort of planning here a strategy. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question, teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? So that tells us immediately uh, that the Jews thought this way, that they understood that even though there are hundreds of these laws, they're not all the same. And so this means that we as Christians, as we think about God's law, we need to understand that there's a there's a context of sort of understanding the heart of God better and understanding what he thinks the priorities are. And so I don't know that the answer here shocked his detractors, but Jesus said, well, there is one that's the first, and this is sort of the Shema from Deuteronomy 5. You know, love the Lord your God with all of your heart and soul. You know that verse, okay? Uh, and so this is sort of focused on God, this vertical relationship. And that is the prime one. That is sort of the most important one. Um, and of course, you know, sort of imagine you're a Jewish person back then, and you're thinking about Sinai and the law, and, and not only the Ten Commandments, but all these hundreds of derivative commandments and nuances of the law. <clears throat> and so here's the creator of the universe, right? 
And the creator of the universe says to his elect people, the first thing is your devotion to me. That has to be foundational. Without that, nothing else is going to work. But then the second one, and this is where some people might have expected him to say something that had to do with ceremony. You know, the second great commandment is keep the Sabbath, do the sacrifices right, something like that. There's not a word there about that kind of stuff. The second great commandment is treat other people right. And that should be a huge, huge insight we have about the views of the creator of the universe. Um, and it doesn't mean those are the, sometimes I've heard people say, and they, they really shouldn't, but they do, that, well, you, you keep the first commandment by doing the second commandment. No, you don't. That's why there are two of them, okay? And, and you don't sort of understand the first one just through the second. There are two. The first one is devotion to God, honor to God, obedience to God. God's the center of your life. And then there's this other one, which is really important to him also, and that's the horizontal one. And that is a fundamental paradigm in the Bible. If you look at the Ten Commandments, what are the two focal points of the Ten Commandments? First, fear about no other gods before me, etc. No graven images. And then the last group are about how you treat other people. You don't kill, you don't covet, you don't lie, you don't commit adultery. Those are all that kind of thing. So even in the Ten Commandments, you have this embedded early on that there are two foci. Okay? Devotion to God. Okay. Now, um, we really should have just a sense of this if you understand that the laws of God are in the context of a relationship with God. But sometimes Christians and Jews sort of lost their focus when they thought these laws had a life of their own apart from the heart of the God who gave them. And this is just really important for us to remember that, and this is a, not anything I thought of, but and I wouldn't Google it because it'll take you places I'm not trying to talk about. Um, but this phrase that the map is not the territory, that is, the map's really helpful. You really have to have a map. And the Bible is a map, but it's not the territory it points to. And on one occasion, Jesus said to the Jews, right? You search the scriptures because you think in them you have life. No, you're not. These are they that bear witness to me. Okay. So the laws, their purpose is sort of to part point us to God. But if you're trying to keep the laws and you don't have this fundamental relationship with God, then it's really tough to figure out what's in the center, what's sort of peripheral, those kind of things. And so... It's just really fundamental to understand this, and that in relational understanding of the law, there are commandments that are prior, just have this ultimate priority, and there are these secondary ones. For example, just give you some other relationships we participate in, um, like in society. We all know it's a crime to murder, right? It's also a crime to litter. A mature thinking person that understands those aren't of equal significance. They're both laws, they're penalties for both of those. Okay, but we know that, okay, one of these is a more fundamental attack on our function in society than the other one is. You could talk about a family relationship, right? Spouses, parents, and kids. You know, there are these fundamental things that have to work in the relationship. There are other things like, you know, my wife and I, she's here today, drove me up here. Um, we have three grown children, but there are times growing up where they did things that, you know, were just aggravating or you told them to do this and they didn't do it. Those are one kind of breaking of the rules. And there are other things children can do, you know, that really are a threat to their dysfunction in the household. And that's why sometimes parents have to put them out. You know, they no longer have a right to be there because of they just, they don't understand the relationship. Um, so I think we understand this in most relationships that they're core, core commitments and then they're peripheral ones. Matthew 23, 23, there's another one. Yep. Um, where Jesus brings us up and he talks about the sinner matters. And he said that these Pharisees, you know, they are really concerned to make sure when they tithe, they also get their sort of spices from the garden and the tithe, they process that. And Jesus said, you know, I don't want you to not do the small commandments because they all are holy. They are all from God. Okay. But you've got to know their core values. Jesus calls them weightier matters of the law. 
Okay, and when he says weightier, that comparative, that means there are some that are less weighty. Right? You should go ahead and keep them, they're from God. But these, these core values, and that depends which translation you're using, uh, faith, justice, and mercy, or maybe your translation will say faithfulness rather than faith, that, it, that word there can go either way. <clears throat> but the point is, Jesus is telling people who are Christ followers, okay, what these things are. And in all of this, Jesus, of course, is taught by Torah in the Old Testament. He went to, you know, he learned it in his home. He learned it in synagogue. If there was a Jewish VBS, he got some there. Jesus had to be, he didn't come out of the womb saying, let's talk about Sinai. So it means for us Christians, we need to have this really robust appreciation for the law in the Old Testament, right? Because these first two commandments, one of them is from Deuteronomy 5 and the other is from Leviticus. Right? That book that nobody hardly <laughs> studies. Leviticus 19.18. And so Christians need to think and talk and, and have it in their soul that the law of God in the Old Testament is just a prime concern of ours. It's, it's a huge compass for our lives. And I will close with Matthew 7, 12, what we call the golden rule. It's okay to call it that. Jesus doesn't call it that. But Jesus says, it's Matthew 7, 12, getting toward the end of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, or what you would want others to do to you, do so to them. And then he says, the reason you do this is because it's the law and the prophets. That's the reason you do this. This is, this is the will of God. This is God's you know, revelation in, in law and prophets. And so, and, and if you follow the theology and the spirituality of the law and the prophets, you cannot miss that you're supposed to treat people right and you're supposed to treat people the way you'd want to be treated. You just can't. Now you can you know, misuse them or not understand them and not get that. But if you spend time in the Word of God in Scripture, the law and the prophets, you're going to get that. And one, way, one reason the prophets in that group, along with the law, is that's one of the things the prophets, as a major thing, in my opinion, the prophets are trying to do, is to get the people of God back to Moses, understood correctly. <laughs> and you read some of their fiercest attacks, like Jeremiah 7, a fierce attack on cultists, on the ceremonial stuff. And if you read what he says, the problem is they're breaking the first two commandments, right? They're worshiping all these bells and all these idols, and they're, they're shed, blood is being shed, and some blood is being shed, and they're oppressing the widows and orphans. First two commandments. And so the prophets are so important because they are good examples of people trying to get the people of God back to the law. And so um, I think what we call the golden rule is a good, good directive for Christians. It's part of just core, core values that Christians should have. And uh, Jesus says we should have it. And I'm trying to be a Christ follower because the law and the prophets have it. And so I hope when you, when you think about law, you don't have this initial sort of like, mm, I'm glad Jesus rescued me from the law. <laughs> you shouldn't say that. <laughs> God will forgive you if you say something so stupid. <laughs> Yeah, sometimes that's stupid. He'll forgive you, but don't, don't keep doing it, okay? Jesus came to point us to an understanding of the law, and of course, some things had to happen once the Gentile mission kicks off. We'll talk about that. But I hope you just have a really positive, sort of a warm feeling in your heart when you think about being a Christ <laughs> follower and, and just the wonderful values and, and the guidance that the law of God gives. It's just it's fantastic. And the psalmist says it's sweeter than honey. It's more valuable than the best gold you can find. Let's pray. God, we are so thankful you did not leave us in this world without guidance. We're grateful that to your elect people, you've given us a special guidance and directives and uh, shown us the path we can walk in where that it's safe and that uh, we will be still your people We'll still be holding you by the hand. We'll still be in the light. 
So we're thankful for that. Help us to be uh, nurtured by your will, your revealed will, your law, um, and give us a love for your law. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.